at PFC, we've been we've been following this for several years now, uh, for a variety of reasons I won't go into. Um, but what I'm going to do here is give you an abstract of a, a lot of very detailed work that has gone on uh, within PFC uh, for quite a few years now. To get a few uh, basic conclusions or observations out there right up front, I think it's pretty clear uh, that that OPEC and non-OPEC countries alike are currently producing about three barrels for every one barrel that they're actually able to find or add back into the the proven and probable reserve base. Uh, we can demonstrate pretty clearly that depletion levels are approaching or exceeding 50 to 60 percent in an increasing number of countries around the world. And I think the empirical data shows pretty clearly that once you hit that level of reserve depletion, uh, you can no longer grow production, and in fact, you can no longer maintain production. You, uh, you inevitably lead to uh, a decline. Uh, for a guy that spent most of his career actually doing exploration, it's pretty obvious to, to the guys that do this for a living that our results have, d despite a lot of hard work and a lot of better technology, we uh, have, have done a pretty good job of finding a lot of small fields, but have not done a very good job of finding large fields that, that have uh, real significant production capacity. When you model the combined effect of all of this, when uh, I'll show this as we move through these slides, uh, it, it's very difficult unless there's a dramatic improvement in, in exploration results over, in a very short period of time. Uh, it's very difficult with any sort of rigorous models uh, to envision uh, a situation where non-OPEC production uh, will uh, grow beyond the early part of the next decade. Um, one of the, the I think, the, the real challenges for people that want to maintain focus uh, on this subject uh, is that there is, in fact, going to be a surge of non-OPEC production over the next few years as, as we develop this wave of deep water discoveries primarily uh, that have been made in recent years. And that surge in production is could uh, could uh, keep up with incremental demand growth. So if you have this combined with any sort of um, uh, OPEC uh, capacity increases, we are going to see a downward uh, pressure on oil price. This is our view of the world right now. Uh, the green line that runs across the middle of that diagram is our, our, our view of long-term uh, non-OPEC conventional crude capacity. When we look at total liquids uh, supply, uh, our range of uncertainty or probabil probability distribution are shown by the blue, green, and red lines running across that diagram a little bit higher. The, uh, the blue bars on there are ExxonMobil's own published long-term non-OPEC liquid supply forecast, which I'm sure many of you have seen over the last couple of years. Um, the, the key here is that as we move into the next decade, if, if our non-OPEC supply picture is one of a, a peak or a long-term plateau, then incremental demand growth beyond that point has got to come from, from OPEC. Um, having spent a lot of time talking to people in Washington, D.C. about this problem, I found that you have to really keep this whole, the, the, the discussion of this, uh, very logical and simple. Um, so I found it very useful to break this whole debate down into a series of critical questions, because if you step through these critical questions, you can actually lead people uh, into understanding uh, this problem. I think the first real question that, that has to be addressed is whether or not uh, analyses like ourselves or even the ExxonMobil curve, do we really believe that this is a credible possibility or probability? Not, not even a certainty, but is this is the possibility of non-OPEC peak or a non-OPEC plateau a, a, a is that is there are there credible models that lead us to the to that? And of course, if the answer to that is yes, then the next obvious conclusion is that if we have incremental demand growth beyond a certain point, that supply has got to come from OPEC. So if you're concerned about long-term energy security issues. Then the next question that follows from that is, uh, does OPEC, and, and there are a certain number of key countries within OPEC uh, specifically listed here, 
but do they really have that reserve inventory to fill that growing gap between non-OPEC production and, and growing global demand in the next decade? And the answer to that is we don't really know because uh, of all the historical uh, and, and in many cases politically motivated reserve revisions within OPEC, we really don't know what the original reserves were or what the remaining reserves are. Uh, so knowing for sure and getting into a bait, debate over whether or not OPEC is going to be able to meet this growing <clears throat> supply demand gap is, is unknown. And I think another critical question here is that in the short term, if the supply demand fundamentals are such that we see downward moving oil prices, and, uh, and, and given the fact that the economy functioned pretty well through a period of very high oil prices, are policymakers uh, going to lose focus on this problem? And I would argue that they probably will. This is a, uh, for those of you that, that aren't very familiar with um, the, the typical life cycle of a producing oil uh, country, um, what typically happens is you find a lot of reserves early in a country's history, and you build up a large surplus of reserves, which uh, then allows the country to build a significant uh, ramp up in its production capacity. But as exploration always goes, you find the big fields early, and then you find a lot of smaller fields later on. So as you ramp up production and, and, and consume that crude oil, you find smaller and smaller fields. So rather than having large positive annual surpluses of crude oil, and that is more oil found than produced, you go into a period of sustained negative balances where you're actually producing more than you um, find. So if you track that depletion over time, which is just simply cumulative reserves uh, produced divided by cumulative reserves discovered, what you find is that over time, as you, as you consume that reserve base, you go through this period of growth into a period of peak or plateau. And that peak or plateau can be one year, it can last for one year, it can last for 10 years. There is a certain point, though, when your depletion reaches 50 or 60 percent uh, that you can't sustain that anymore, and you fall off that peak or plateau and start to decline. Now, when I was in graduate school in the late 70s, early 1980s, um, there, there was a similar debate as to whether or not the world was running out of oil and, and this question of peak oil. Uh, at that time, there was only one country that actually had gone through this life cycle, and that was the United States. Uh, now as we have this debate, there are many, many more countries that have gone through this life cycle. Uh, the bars that are shown on this diagram represent the length or duration of that peak or plateau period. So during years to the left-hand side of these bars, you had production growth. In the years to the right-hand side of these bars, you have production decline. And you can see here that, that as we've moved through the 1990s in particular and into uh, this decade, the number of countries that have, have experienced this life cycle have, has increased uh, significantly. Well, if you go back and you reconstruct this depletion history for every one of these countries, which is how we've approached this problem, what you find is that it is actually pretty consistent as to where this happens. Uh, it's not always right at 50 percent. It's not always right at 60 percent. In some cases, it's, it happens before that. But generally speaking, um, once you approach 50 percent, uh, you start to see countries struggling to to grow or maintain production. And then once you hit 60 percent, it's virtual, all of them virtually go into decline. The average here is about 53 percent. Now, we've not tried to use a Hubbard curve solution in any of our analysis. Uh, we've, we've deliberately tried to stay away from that. But I think you can see here that, that, that as that was applied to the United States years ago, it, it holds up consistently uh, and holds up pretty well. Well, there are also quite a few other countries that are, are getting very cl close to that uh, 50 or 60 percent depletion level. Uh, when I showed this slide uh, four years ago, three years ago, there were uh, seven countries on this slide. 
uh, that we're at in a peak or plateau where we were suggesting that near-term declines were, were probably going to happen as a result of high depletion levels. And sure enough, three of those countries have moved off of this slide and onto the slide that I showed you previously. So you have, in addition to the countries which are already in decline or in a plateau, uh, there are some significant producers that we suspect are not far off from uh, suffering the same fate. Uh, I always like to show this slide because uh, I think it's, it, I, th I, th I don't think it's something that most people realize or recognize. Um, conventional crude oil, conventional non-OPEC crude oil has been increasing over the last several years. Um, but that has largely been the result of production increases in the former Soviet Union and, and in past years, specifically Russia. Uh, if you look at non-OPEC production outside of Russia over the last decade, almost all that growth has come, or almost uh, all the other production outside of Russia has been relatively flat. So since 1998, exclusive of Russia, non-OPEC production has been pretty, pretty static or flat. Um, and I think it's also worth pointing out that from an oil company's perspective or an explorationist perspective, the $60 oil prices that we've seen in the last year or so, to us, that's, that, that isn't the, the, a very recent occurrence of high oil prices. We've been in a high oil price environment. For those of us that have had to fight for budget dollars to get wells drilled, uh, we've been in a high, high price oil environment since 1999. Right after the recovery in 98, we went to $20 and, and, or more in terms of crude prices. And throughout my 20-year career as an explorationist, if we were consistently at 18, we were pretty happy. So high oil prices and a lot of activity since 1998 have, have not enabled OPEC or non-OPEC to increase production outside of Russia. If you look at uh, that block of 30 million barrels a day production, which represents non-OPEC production outside of the FSU, and track these annual crude oil balances, you see that back in the 70s and the 80s, uh, we, we were actually finding more crude oil than we were producing. We went into a period of 1980 through the mid-1980s where we were still a little bit on the positive side, but you know, getting pretty close to zero. However, as we moved into the late 80s and into the 1990s, um, we've been uh, producing more than we've been finding pretty, consistent, pretty consistently to the point where now we're producing about 4 billion barrels a year, more every year than we're finding within that group of countries that uh, comprises that 30 million barrels a day production. That one spike you see there in the mid-90s is actually not a discovery. That was the transfer of reserves from Saudi Arabia in, into uh, Bahrain's account. It, uh, uh, one of the Saudi fields was literally donated to the Bahrainis and, and fell outside of OPEC production. So that's not, in fact, even a discovery. If you take that 30 million barrels a day production and you actually trace the depletion history of that block of production, what I had suggested for all those various countries that have gone into decline uh, pretty much holds up. If you look at that entire block of production uh, and track the depletion history, sure enough, in 1998, as we hit a started to hit the, this higher oil price environment, uh, our depletion level within that 30 million barrels a day production hit about 50%. And we've now moved through that 50 to 60% zone, and uh, we're getting pretty close to the point where we would, in fact, expect decline from this critical uh, chunk of conventional crude oil production. If you actually look at daily rates versus base declines uh, for some selected countries, what you actually find if you go back and you subtract out production that was, was uh, that began prior to the year 2000 and, and look at what has been happening to that production. So taking out the effect of the new fields that have come on stream, you'll find that depending on the country, decline rates are anywhere from 3% on the low side to double digit in some cases, as in the case of, of Great Britain. So um, uh, there, there are the decline rates and, you know, for people that try to do forward-looking uh, crude oil supply forecast, oftentimes there were assumptions of an underlying 2 or 3% decline rate, but in fact it's, it's much higher than that. 
If you actually go back and look at this, again, this 30 million barrels of production that hasn't increased since 1998, it's not because we haven't found or developed new oil fields. In fact, there, there has been about 7 million barrels a day of incremental new production that has been brought on stream. Uh, the problem is that that 7 million barrels a day that we brought on stream in the last few years, uh, for every new barrel we brought on stream, we've only basically been able to offset one barrel of decline in one, so one of these older fields. And when you look at the current withdrawal rates and you build models of current withdrawal rates uh, versus remaining reserves in that block of production, what you end up with is an overall underlying dec decline rate of 4 to 7 percent, which doesn't sound like a lot. But what that means is that what that chunk of production that accounts for 30 million barrels a day of conventional crude oil today uh, will be down to less than 10 million barrels a day within 15 years. And uh, that means even to keep that plateau stable uh, that we've seen since 1998, uh, you, have to you have to find, discover, and develop uh, 20 million barrels a day of, of new crude capacity. So if you take all these reserves uh, and all of these fields that we know of today, P1 plus P2 reserves, uh, it's almost impossible to find a way through enhanced oil recovery or any other way to assume that that, that is going to continue. Uh, in all likelihood, after this next wave of deep water discoveries is developed in this group of countries, uh, declines will set in. Now, if you, even if you bring in some pretty aggressive assumptions about new exploration reserves, which would be, uh, for, for example, uh, Mexico, the Mexican sector of the Gulf of Mexico opening up and, and the addition of another 10 billion barrels of reserves there and continued exploration success in Angola and continued exploration success in Brazil. You still can't, because of the cycle time that is required to find and develop those, those, uh, those reserves in much harsher environments, all you're really able to do, you can't grow this block of production, all you're really able to do is take that cliff that is facing us in the next few years and keep pushing that out just a little bit uh, further over time. So the scope, the, the, the likelihood that there's, th that this 30 million barrels a day of production can be grown uh, is, is pretty low. Now in the former Soviet Union, it's slightly different. It's a much smaller chunk of non-OPEC conventional crude production, but there are some big fields in the Caspian that are going to get developed. There are some big discoveries in East Siberia that will probably get developed. So there is scope here for about 3 million or so barrels a day production. So that when you go, uh, when, you, when you look at a long-term supply forecast, we do think conventional crude oil production is going to increase by a few million barrels a day between now, today, and, and the uh, period between 2010 and 2015. And uh, this is also uh, supported by, by some of the uh, some of the, some of the uh, forecasts that have been put out there by ExxonMobil, in fact. If you go back and look at just the absolute number of barrels, you know, we hear a lot about new discoveries in West Africa, new discoveries in deep water, and how this is going to solve our problems. But when you actually look at the, the difference between total reserves produced and total reserves discovered in the post-1990 period, uh, the, the the negative differences or the negative differentials between um, volumes produced and discovered in places like the former Soviet Union, Europe, Asia, these numbers are much bigger than the, the, the places like West Africa where you see these positive balances. Uh, you can't possibly over, overcome uh, that with new discoveries. If you, if you then roll in the former Soviet Union, you and look back to 1985, which is far back as we actually have uh, production data f for the Soviet Union, uh, former Soviet Union, you see that these negative balances now for all of non-OPEC conventional crude production are about 8 billion uh, barrels per year, and that's been, that's been going on now for uh, quite, a, quite a period of time. One of the, the things, though, that people don't recognize is that during this period of, of uh, lower reserve additions through exploration, our production rates have gone up considerably. So look at the case for, for, of Western Europe, for example. Uh, close to 60% of all the barrels that were, have been found in the UK and Norway in particular 
uh, were produced in just the last 15 years. But during that same period of time, only 15% of the reserves were actually, of all the reserves that are currently known for those two countries, ha were discovered during that same period of time. So our withdrawal rates uh, in some of these places are uh, considerably, uh, considerably high relative to the, the, the total reserve, the total volume of the original reserve base. Now, now going forward, uh, this is actually the same supply curve broken out by, by geographic region. Uh, and I th uh, you can see there that the conventional s supply, we think, will get up to about 45 million barrels a day of capacity, uh, which is a little bit higher than today. But I think you can see here that uh, by far what is going to uh, get us up to 65 million barrels uh, going forward is unconventional heavy oil in Venezuela in Canada and NGL and condensate production. Uh, because of the, the growth and uh, demand for gas globally, uh, because of the large number of LNG projects that are being developed, there will be uh, quite a bit of liquids growth coming out of, uh, of developments associated with gas. And that is what gets us in our forecast and another forecast that you will see out there up to this plateau of about 65 million barrels in the early part of the next decade. And this is just a, a probabilistic distribution of where we think the total non-OPEC liquid supply is going to go. Uh, from about 55 million barrels where we are right now, um, we, we see the possibility of that getting up into the low to mid-60s. Uh, but it's almost impossible for us without, as I mentioned earlier, dramatic improvement in exploration results to, to get much better than that. So when you look at this on a decade-by-decade decade basis, if you go back and, and track total reserve, um, total average annual reserve additions, um, at, the current, at our current demand levels, uh, we're, over the next 15 years, we're going to be consuming, um, the call on reserves outside of North America is going to be about 30 billion barrels a year. And we haven't been finding volumes like that uh, since the, uh, maybe the, uh, the 70s, but certainly not beyond. And in the last uh, couple of uh, time periods shown here, you can see that the average annual additions have fallen off dramatically. The last two years of exploration results globally have been the worst since World War II. So despite these high prices, despite a renewed interest and in re renewed incentives for companies to get out there and find more, and despite more drilling activity, despite the fact that you can't find a drilling rig right now because they're, they're, they're completely utilized. We've had the two worst years of exploration we've had. And the only reason they were worse in World War II is because you couldn't explore in World War II, during World War II. What that means is, and I, you know, when you get into these discussions, of course, you always hear the USGS reserve estimates brought out there, where we still have a trillion barrels of, of crude oil to find. Um, the problem is that, um, when you go out and you actually talk to the people in, in outside of these government agencies whose job it is to actually go out there and find this stuff, they, they have no clues to where this trillion barrels of reserves actually is. Um, and these guys are guys whose salaries and bonuses depend on finding that stuff, and it's extremely difficult. Um, but what it really means is that the, we have to return, in order to stabilize depletion levels at, where they are currently, and, av and avoid this long-term plateau or decline, you have, to, you, you have to do something to bring back a slope on the creaming curve, which matches the slope that we had during the 50s and the 60s. And, and I will tell you, as a you know, company that spends most of our time talking to people inside these companies whose job it is to do this, we found very few people that are optimistic um, and, and explorationists by nature are optimistic, you have to be, because of course you're wrong most of the time. But uh, we, have found, we have found very few explorationists out there in the industry that we deal with that, that feel that we can, we can get back to the glory days of the 1950s and 60s in terms of our exploration success. So that's what really leads us to, to this slide right here, and I think to, uh, to the, the, the problem that we all face. There are a lot of financial institutions that see uh, downward uh, 
prices, a downward trend in prices here between now and 2010 or 2012. And the reason for this is that with this, uh, with, with the planned capacity increases in OPEC and with the, uh, the surge of production coming from uh, liquids associated with a lot of new gas developments and liquids associated with a lot of the deep water fields that are being developed, uh, there's a real possibility that OPEC spare capacity uh, will be developed. And, and the reason for a lot of the prices, the high prices you've seen, is that the, the gap between demand and, and total global capacity has ba basically, the, the two lines converged on each other as, as a lot of that OPEC spare capacity was consumed. Well, some of that could come back. And if some of that could come back, then you plug in, you build standard supply and demand models, and clearly there is reason to think that prices could fall. And what I think, what I personally think uh, will happen is that the, the folks in Washington, D.C., and the folks that determine a lot of our energy policy will lose, uh, will lose focus on this problem. If oil prices fall back into the 40s or the 30s, as, as uh, some people believe, then um, it's going to be very difficult uh, to maintain focus on this problem. And in fact, I would argue that if oil prices were now $30 a barrel, there'd probably be half the number of people uh, attending this conference that are here today.